When did that start? Man. All right. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Hope everybody's doing well. Again, my name is Diallo, and I'm here for this lovely, on this lovely Monday, May 24th, 2021. And we're going to be doing current events today. Well, that's why, that's why we're going to read some current events. So if you forgot, then this is what we're going to read. We're going to read out of the East Bay Times, get some local news, some international news, and some news of the weird. And my favorite, the Ask Amy Advice column. Okay. So, again, it's May 24th, 2001. Who would have thought that they would have got to 2021? It's amazing, huh? Yes. We all know a lot of people who didn't make it this far. So you're blessed to have made this far, aren't you? Uh -huh. There's a lot of people who went way too soon, and there are people that are still alive who probably should, right? Some horrible people. Like, how is that a horrible person still alive? This nice person's not. I don't get it. But everybody's put on this earth for a reason, right? Good or bad, they're put on here for a reason. To influence somebody in a good way. So we're going to start with some local news here. We're going to start. At the side show. See if we can get some good news here, huh? Just absolutely. Let's see. Lots of graduations this weekend, right? Lots of graduations. We're in May. So a lot like last week was Cal Berkeley's graduations. So all week you saw the Cal Berkeley students walking around in their cap and gowns ready to join adulthood, right? So we're going to look at what's to blame for California's drought. If you don't know, we're in a drought again. California goes through a drought about every 10 or 15 years because we're in a Mediterranean climate, and that's just the way it works. You know, you'll get rain for four or five years, and then you'll be kind of rain, and then you get a big drought for four or five years. About every 15, 20 years is a big drought. Just what it is. But it, those droughts get more severe as more and more people move to California. The population gets bigger, the, 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 the strain on the water resources gets worse. So if a, reserve, a natural reservoir has, I don't know, during a regular, has 100% water during a regular time, and then during the drought time, and it's 50% water, when you add more people in there, all of a sudden, instead of 50% water during the drought, it has 10% water, because more people are using water. So let's see, what's the blame for California's drought? What do you think is the blame for California's drought? Too many people. Too many people? So what do we do with all the people? Wherever they come from, we should be back. Send them back. Mm -hmm. <laughs> send them back to, send them back to Nevada and Oklahoma. <laughs> All right, let's see. California's new drought is worsening. After two severely dry winters, reservoirs are shrinking, fire danger is rising, and water supplies are looking more tenuous. The past two years have been the driest in nearly half a century since 1976-77. How did the state find itself in a new crisis just as COVID-19 pandemic is fading? Scientists say Californians' parched plight largely comes down to two words atmospheric river. An increasing body of research is showing that the state's water supply each year depends almost entirely on a handful of big make or break storms. In the last two winters, too few arrived. These moisture rich atmospheric river events, also called pineapple express storms, barreling it off the Pacific Ocean each winter can provide up to 50% of the state's annual rainfall. If California receives more atmospheric river storms than normal, as it 
as it did in 2017, reservoirs fill, roads wash out, and floodwaters rise. Fewer than normal for a couple of years in a row, like this winter and last winter in California is high and dry. In other words, the water outlook for the nation's most populous state each year is like a gambler putting his whole paycheck down on the roulette wheel. Hit the right atmospheric river number, happy days ahead. But miss the mark and hard times follow. Atmospheric rivers literally make or break the water supply for California, said Marty Ralph, director of the Center of Western Weather and Water Extremes at UC San Diego. If we don't get enough, we descended to drought. Four years ago, in the winter of 2017, California was pummeled. California was pummeled by 51 atmospheric river storms, 14 of which were classified as strong or extreme by the volume of moisture they carried. So much rain fell that year, the state's historic five-year drought was broken. Downtown San Jose suffered $100 million in flood damage, and the spillway at Buttes County's Oroville Dam, the nation's tallest, collapsed that year during a downpour, prompting the evacuation of 188,000 people. So if you think back to 2017, that Oroville Dam broke and they were scared that the whole town of Oroville was gonna flood to evacuate 188,000 people. There are parts, you know, Highway 1 that goes down the coast from Oregon to basically Mexico. Part of that near San Luis Obispo washed away and it took almost a year and a half to fix it. But during the winter of 2019-20, there were fewer such storms, 43. And most important, just one was strong or extreme. This past winter saw more of the same. 30 atmospheric river storms blowing two were considered strong, Ralph said. One on January 28th dumped 15 inches of rain on Big Sur, washing out Highway 1. It also delivered more than seven feet of snow to the Sierra Nevada, but it was an endangered species. Strong or extreme atmospheric rivers can produce copious rainfall and snowfall, Ralph said. Weak and moderate ones can add up, but we're starting to think the stronger ones are most impactful and are the biggest drivers of the water supply. <sighs> Every time I read, I got a yawn. That's pretty crazy, huh? Yeah. But the water? Oh, yeah. No, not me yawning. Yeah. <laughs> not me yawning. Hmm. All right, so let's see what else you got. How about this one from right off the coast here of California? Great white sharks rank swell. Who, anybody here ever been in the water with a great white shark? Mm -hmm. If you were swimming in an ocean, like out here in the bay, there was probably a great white shark around you and you didn't even know it. Because <laughs> it's not like Jaws where they just attack people. The sharks aren't like that, except for bull sharks. They'll just attack anything. <laughs> You're still more likely to see them. You're still more likely to see them in movies or TV shows than in person. But the number of great white sharks appears to be increasing along the Northern California coast, says scientists who spend years tracking hundreds of the toothy predators by their distinct fence. The exhaustive new study concluded there are nearly 300 adult and subadult white sharks living in Monterey Bay the Farallon Islands of Bodega Bay, an area sometimes called the Red Triangle. Why do they call it the Red Triangle? There's a lot of shark attacks happen there. Why? Because in the Red Triangle, there's usually large seal populations. And what kind of animals like to eat seals? Great white sharks. And also lots of orcas. You know what an orca is? A killer whale. Although a killer whale is not actually a whale, it's a dolphin. So you learn something new every day. A killer whale is not a whale, it's a dolphin. The big dolphin with big teeth. 
They're like the, they're like the, they call them the wolves of the sea because they travel in packs like wolves do, and they will tear you up. Not people, but uh, other animals. They'll tear, they'll eat great white sharks. They'll, well, they don't eat them, they kill them, and then they suck out their liver. So what they do with the shark is they'll hit it with their nose a whole bunch of times from different angles, and then they'll flip over the shark on its back. Because when a shark is on its back, it goes into a catatonic state, like it's in a coma. And this is with all shark species. If you flip them over, they just kind of do this. So the, uh, the killer whales have learned how to do that, to flip over the shark, to you know, hit it with his nose first, to stun it, then flip it over. And then they go after its side where its liver is, they bite into it and they suck out the liver. And then it's left the red, they'll leave, they leave the rest of the shark floating. So other animals can come and get it. Circle of life, it's nasty, huh? Maybe uh, that shark was gonna do the killer whale and they... Oh, because they've seen it. Oh. Yeah, because the dolphins use echolocation. So it's like sonar. They go, like sub-frequency stuff, and the sound bounces in the out until it hits something and then it comes back. Mm -hmm. And they do it again and it bounces and it comes back. So as it's bouncing, it's getting return off of objects. So they can pinpoint where, not, where a fish is, where a shark is, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Sub-adult sharks are not fully mature, but still big enough to eat seals, sea lions, and other marine mammals. That's a modest increase from 10 years ago, researchers say, and a clear indication that ocean conditions in the area are generally trending in the right direction. A healthy population of white sharks means there are a healthy population of sea lions and elephant seals they eat, said Paul Knive, a marine ecologist with Minnesota State University and lead author of the study. And that means that the lower levels of the food chain, like fish, are healthy enough to support the marine mammals. So more, more sharks is a good thing. More sharks means there's more fish overall. More fish overall, better, eco better ecosystem in the water. So that's good. With hundreds of sharp triangular teeth and the ability to swim 35 miles per hour, great whites are amazing hunters. They can grow up to 20 feet long and weigh more than 4,000 pounds. So imagine a 20 foot long shark that weighs 4,000 pounds, that's as wide as a bus coming at you. How scary would that be? Yeah. It could literally swallow you whole. It wouldn't, it would just bite you in half <laughs> and then spit you out because they don't like the taste of humans. <laughs> <laughs> For generations, they have been mysterious and often feared. Scientists knew little about how many there were, where they swam, or their mating habits. Most people learned about great white sharks from movies like Jaws, which sensationalized their threat to humans. Who remembers Jaws, the movie? Surfer, gone, underwater, blood everywhere. <laughs> All right. Let's see what else we got. You guys know Cheech and Chong? The movie Cheech and Chong? Tommy Chong is 83 today. Wow. So here's one from Italy. This is not a happy one, okay? Cable car plunges to the ground, killing at least 14. This is from Rome, Italy. A cable car taking visitors to a mountaintop view of some of northern Italy's most picturesque lakes plummeted to the ground Sunday and then tumbled down the slope, killing 14 people. The lone survivor, a young child, was hospitalized in serious condition with broken bones, authorities said. Six of the dead were Israeli citizens, including a family of four who lived in Italy. 
the Israeli foreign minister said. It wasn't clear if the other couples were related. The mayor of Stressa, where the incident occurred, said it appeared that the cable broke, seeing the car careening until it hit a pylon and then fell to the ground. At that point, the car overturned two or three times before hitting some trees, said, said Mayor Mar Marcelo Seravino. Some of those who died were thrown from the cabin. So how scary would that be? You're in a cable car and it just snaps and you fall. Oh. The Italian government announced, on a, announced a commission to investigate the disaster, which is likely to renew questions about the quality and safety of Italy's transportation infrastructure. Images from the site showed the crumbled car in a, in, a, uh, in, a clear, in a clearing of a thick patch of pine trees near the summit of the Monterone Peak overlooking Lake Maggiore. Oh, that's where Maggiore is. Lake Maggiore. The car was believed to have fallen around 50 feet, according to the Italian media. It was terrible, terrible seeing Cerevino told Italians Sky TG24. The plunge on the Tressa, on the Tressa Monteron line happened about 100 yards before the final pylon, said Walter Milan, spokesman for the Italian's Alpine Rescue Service. By Sunday evening, the death toll had risen to 14 dead after one of two children taken to Turin's Regina Margarita Children's Hospital died. The child died after several attempts to restart his heart failed, and there was nothing more we could do, said hospital spokesman Pierre Palo Berra. The other young child, who arrived at the hospital contest, remained in serious condition, authorities said. It's sad. These two little kids lost their whole family. The family of four, they all died. Oh, it's terrible. Terrible. All right, let's see what else we got. What? That's a weird story. All right, let's see what else we got here. Before we get on to our advice column. Always. So this is from Minneapolis, Minnesota. Floyd's family holds rally, March in his memory. Members of George, George Floyd's family and other and others who lost loved ones to police encounters joined activists and citizens in Minneapolis on Sunday for a march that was one of several events planned nationwide to mark the one year anniversary of Floyd's death. The George Floyd Memorial Foundation, a nonprofit based in Fayetteville, North Carolina, where Floyd was born, is hosting a series of events in Minneapolis this weekend and early next week to honor Floyd on the anniversary. Those events include the rally and a march downtown on Sunday that would be led by Floyd's family and other families of victims of police violence. The nonprofit was launched by Floyd's siblings in September 2020 to help combat racial inequities in black and brown communities in their brother's honor. Other events in Minneapolis ahead of the anniversary included a virtual day of action that encourages people to organize remotely and, to, and two panels with families and other activists today, followed by a community festival and candlelight vigil on Tuesday. Tuesday will mark the one year, mark one year since Floyd, who was black, died after a former Minneapolis police officer, Derek Chauvin, held his knee on Floyd's neck as Floyd pleaded for air. Chauvin, who was white, shouldn't matter, um, who's white, has since been convicted of murder and manslaughter for Floyd's death, which sparked worldwide pro protest and calls for change in policing in the United States. In New York on Sunday, Floyd's brother, Terrence, attended a Brooklyn gathering in his brother's mem memory organized by Reverend Al Sharpton and told supporters not to forget his brother or victims of racist violence. 
you keep my brother's name ringing, you're going to keep everyone else's name ringing, Terrence Floyd said. Breonna Taylor, Sean Bell, Amon Arbery, you could go through the whole list. There's a lot of them. Executive Director Jakari Harris said the group has received donations from the Minneapolis Foundation, Black Lives Matter Global Network Foundation, and athletic shoe and apparel retailer Finish Line, among others. Despite large grants from corporations and other organizations, Harris, the average of, Harris, the average donation to be nonprofit was $47. Harris said the group has also funded an initiative in Fayetteville to help reduce homelessness, a scholarship program for law school students and an internship program at Texas A&M University where Floyd went to school. So yeah, that's that. Who here's been the Lake Tahoe? Never, except for Robert. You've been there. Have you been to Lake Tahoe? Yeah. Jose, have you ever been to Lake Tahoe? It's a beautiful place. The lake is really, really cold. <laughs> it's a very, very cold lake. I am hot. Get some air on me. All right. So let's see here. Now we're going to read the advice column. So I'm going to ask Amy and Miss Manners. We're going to start with Miss Manners. This one's titled Wedding Gift Rule Amended. Everybody here has been to a wedding at one point or another. You're supposed to get a wedding gift, right? So let's read this. Dear Miss Manners, someone I know who just got married six months ago has caught her husband cheating and now is filing for divorce. The question is, do they need to return the wedding gifts? What do you think? Yes. They've been married six months, she caught her husband cheating. Should, we, should she return the wedding gifts? No. Yeah. no. So here's Miss Manners' reply. Gentle reader, did they write each person to give thanks for those presents? Miss Manners asked because she is making a new rule, or rather amending the old one. The old rule was that the wedding presents must be returned after a broken engagement, even if the engagement is broken at the altar, but that they need to not be returned if the wedding took place, regardless of whether the marriage lasts. She now declares that this only holds if thanks for those presents have already been sent. So she says, no, keep the presents. <laughs> All right, so next one. Dear Miss Manners, my husband and I have formed a pod with three other couples who are good friends. We enjoy having dinner parties and gatherings with the other couples. We all get along wonderfully and everyone lives within 30 minutes of each other. We all take turns hosting dinners or backyard barbecues. The event is totally up to the couple hosting. We have great meals, wine and conversation. The problem is the wife of one of the couples it doesn't matter. The problem is the wife of one of the couples. It doesn't matter who was hosting the event or if it is formal, elegant dinner party or a casual backyard patio meal. This one person will in invariably ask what is being planned to serve. If she were to ask me what I plan to make, 
and I said fish, she might say, oh, well, I haven't had pork chops for a long time. <laughs> Sometimes she will even say without, e without even asking about the menu that she would really like chicken cord cordon bleu or whatever it might be that would please her palate that day. Keep in mind, she has no allergies nor, or no issue with gluten, nor is she lactose intolerant. I was brought up that when you are invited to someone's house for a meal, you eat whatever they prepare, unless, of course, there are allergies, etc. We would like to get it across her, to her that way, that we don't appreciate this. As I said, we are all good friends, so we don't want to cause a rift. What do you think? Should they tell the lady, like, look, lady, you're going to get, you're going to eat what you get. So if I make Cheerios tomorrow, you're going to eat some Cheerios. Okay. <laughs> Let's see what Miss Manners has to say. Then, dear gentle reader, then stop answering impertinent questions as if it were proper, as if it were proper for her to ask them. To inquiries about what you plan to make, Miss Manners suggests a surprise even if the surprise is take out pizza. To her suggestions respond, that sounds wonderful. We'll look forward to eating that when it's your turn to host. Flip it right back on her. Watch out. And if you need a general admonishment, you must miss restaurants where you can order what you want. I'm afraid none of us can manage that and I hope you find it worthwhile to enjoy our company anyway. Ooh, that's brutal. That's rough. Uh, she the lady probably look at you like, really? Like, that is insane. Can't believe I, I just got told to basically shut up, right? Oh, man. So now we're going to talk about, we're going to go to Ask Amy. This one is uh, titled Mom Questions D-Ad Naming Children. Oh, dead naming children, not dead naming. Mom questions dead naming children. So what, what does dead naming mean? I have no idea there. We're going to find out. So here's the letter from the, from, the, from the person. Dear Amy, recently my oldest child, age 20, came out as NB. What? M-B, E-N-B-Y, M-B. So recently, my 20-year-old child, age 20, came out as N-B, which means non-binary, and is in the process of transitioning to present, presenting more female than male by taking hormones, having laser, having laser facial hair removal, and growing their hair long. Okay. My N-B child is in college and lives four hours away. My youngest son is also in college and lives out of town. I live in a small town. When friends of our family ask, how are your boys? I answer, they're both well and doing well in school. People sometimes ask about my oldest son and I will answer using the pronoun they, that child, that child preferred pronoun. I don't want to offer other information about my eldest son's transition. I feel that's, the story, that's their story to tell and not mine. My oldest now goes by a chosen name. I use this name when speaking to people who are aware of their transition. So basically her son is transitioning to a woman. Yeah. So that son thinks that, you know, they're not non-binary. So he, he feels that he's a woman. So he's gonna take hormones and transition to a woman. Okay. Is it okay to re is it okay to refer to my son by the name? Is it okay to refer to my old oldest son by the name they had from age zero to 20 to those that do not know about the new name? It seems easier for me, but sort of a denial of my child's true self. So again, they're transitioning from transitioning from a a male to a female because he thinks that being a female is his true self. He's going to take hormones, he's going to get a facial laser surgery removal, maybe uh, cut off his wing wing eventually. I don't know. See what the response is from Amy. 
Dear Mom, to clarify, NB, E N B Y, stands for NB, non binary, which describes the gender identification of a person who does not clearly identify as either male or female. Your oldest has transitioned from the male gender assigned at birth toward a non binary gender identification. Part of that transition has been to choose a new name. Transgender or non binary people often refer to the name given to them at birth as their dead name. And while a mom who chose that name at birth might choose to think of it as a birth name, the practice of dead naming using this previous name, either intentionally or unintentionally, is considered disrespectful. You should talk to your eldest son and ask how they would like to handle this. What is, the e what is easier for you and others in your circle might not be easier, preferred, or respectful for them. I understand your reasoning that this transition is your oldest son's story to tell and not yours, but that might also be an avo avoidance reaction because you just don't feel like explaining this somewhat complex situation to people you fear might not understand this process or accept your child. You might say, my oldest son is undergoing a gender transition and has changed their name. So from now on, we will all use this name. They're doing well, right? Really well. They're doing really well, and thank you for asking. You should check glad.org for helpful guidelines on how to be a supportive ally. So what do you think of that? What would you do if, if your son came to you and said that I, I don't want to be a male anymore, I want to be a female, and I want to take hormones and change everything? What would your reaction be to that? Would you be supportive of it? They're your son. I don't think so. Mm -hmm. God, the God guidance is supposed to be. Yeah. Don't you think God would kind of create it in that way? Yeah, if you want him to be that. Yeah. Agree. yeah. That's a good answer. All right. So now we're going to look at today in history. Which is... here today in history so what i'm going to do today is may 24th 2021 so we're going to go back in time and look at may 24th in different dates in the past so first date is may 24th 1844 samuel fb morse transmitted the message what hath God wrought from Washington to Baltimore as he formally opened America's first telegraph line? Right? Do, 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 telegraph. May 24th, 1935. The first Major League Baseball game played at night took place at Cincinnati's Crowsley Field. So before 1935, they didn't have night baseball games. They're all played at like one o'clock, which meant all those guys who went out drinking the night before, they show up to the ballpark and hammer drunk. <laughs> May 24th, 1961. Freedom riders were arrested after arriving at a bus terminal in Jackson, Mississippi, charged with breaching the peace for entering a white designated area. So the Freedom Riders were, they got on a bus and rode through the South protesting against discrimination and segregation. At one time, this group of KKK members stopped the bus on the road, started rocking the bus to try to tip it over, couldn't tip it over. So instead they, get, they lit up Molotov cocktails and threw them in the bus. And the bus lit up on fire with people in it. Luckily all the people got out. And there was another case 
during that same freedom ride where a couple of the freedom riders who were in their own station wagon disappeared. Turned out a racist person, KKK guy, found them and one of the people was white, found them, hung them and then buried their bodies. Yes. Yep. So May 24th, 1994. Four Islamic fundamentalists convicted of bombing New York's World Trade Center in 1993 were each sentenced to 240 years in prison. That was the first time the World Trade Center was bombed. What they did is they had a, a, a van, like a work van, full of nitroglycerin like thousands of pounds of it to where it shook the, the World Trade Center building was like 150 stories, maybe 200 stories. It shook the whole thing and everything around. They went to the underground parking lot and it almost collapsed the bottom parking lot. Hmm. Crazy. So let's look at news of the weird. This one's called a slow process. When Damien DeShrocher, 28, decided to return to nature in December, it meant leaving his job as an Air Force computer technician and moving to the northern French town of Wahajanese, where he started raising snails. But they're not for eating, Reuters reported, Dechenneurs harvest slime from snails and uses it to make bars of soap. A single snail will yield about two grams of slime. Derocher needs about 80 grams of slime to make 15,100 gram soap bars. Sorry, Let me do it again. So Derocher needs about 80 grams of slime to make 15. 100 grams, 100 grams soap bars. It's all in the dexterity of how you tickle, he said, of harvesting technique. So he tickles the snails to get the slime. <laughs> and they're in bars of soap that you use. How about that? Snail slime and bars of soap, you don't even know it. Sounds kind of gross, huh? It's nature. It's nature. People eat mayonnaise, right? Mayonnaise is nasty. This looks nasty. So thank you again for joining me for current events. My name is Diallo. Again, have a safe, wonderful day. Enjoy it. It's beautiful. Wear your mask. And away we go. That's my new catchphrase. And away.